Next up on our awards is uh, broadcast engineering. We're honoring Mr. Hugh Hickerson. Uh, he was a behind the scenes guy, admittedly says that, uh, but without his efforts, there are a large network you would never have heard of before. So let's uh, roll it on Hugh. Hugh, you, uh, you grew up in Aaron, Tennessee. Yeah. So, as a kid growing up in Aaron, was there something in Aaron that got you interested in audio and in broadcasting? Uh, there was a TV shop in, uh, in Aaron, and uh, my sister worked there as the receptionist, I guess you'd say in the uh, TV shop. She was about four years older than me, and so when I was riding my bicycle around a small town, I would stop in there and I became friends, I guess, or I, I don't know what you'd call it. I became interested in the uh, electronic technology. And so I decided at a very young age that I wanted to get into electronics. I was never really into audio as such, but because of my interest in electronics, I became interested in radio stations. And as a matter of fact, I built a radio station mock-up in my, my family's home. And, uh, and this, uh, this uh, TV service man built me a mixer, you know, a little 1287, uh, had like three tubes for six inputs. Uh, well, no, I guess it had uh, had more than that. Uh, yeah, six, three, three tubes, t two two inputs to the tube, and uh, so it had six inputs. And uh, I had a console, and I bought a couple of small turntables from Lafayette Radio, if you remember Lafayette Radio. Oh yeah. And <laughs> and uh, so that was my hobby when I was a uh, teenager, youngster. Well, did you put a transmitter on that and? Uh... Sorry? Tear, did you uh, build a transmitter and tear the neighborhood I, out? I never really, really built a transmitter. People always accused me of having a transmitter, and I, and I had a uh, RF generator that I would connect my audio into sometimes and and play with the radio around the you know the area where I lived, but I, I never really transmitted. Uh, people accused me of it, but I didn't really. I started studying electronics through a correspondence class, or a correspondence course out of Louisville, Kentucky, when I was uh, still in high school. And I worked at the theater. I was a projectionist at the theater in Erin until I finished high school. And uh, I guess the, uh, the year after I graduated from high school, I got my first class FCC license. And so at that point, I was ready to uh, try to get a job in a radio station. I had visited radio stations all around and and uh, that was kind of my interest. But then um, I came to uh, Nashville and as a matter of fact worked in a supermarket for uh, uh, about a year and then I went to California and ended up going to work for a um, uh, Space and Rocket Company, that's, that's what I was and uh, and uh, where we tested rockets, and so uh, it was uh, strictly electronics. There was no audio involved in it, although it was uh, you know signaling uh, uh, and analog signaling, and I had to deal with those kind of things. I was out there for three years, and I came back here in '64. When I came back here in '64, I. Uh, I uh, was without a job for a while, but I had my FCC license. Aaron Shelton was the uh, chief engineer at uh, WSM-TV before it became WSMV, and uh, and Aaron had uh, some relatives that lived down in Houston County, and so uh, you know he knew me, or or people in Houston County knew of me. And uh, so he gave me a job at WSM-TV at the transmitter. Well, my initial encounter was uh, something that I've just never forgotten. Um, when I came to work for Operating Productions, and this would be 1978, um, Hugh, who I did not meet, uh, had just been promoted to assistant chief engineer. 
but he had gone to California uh, to some video school at Ampex on uh, videotape machines. Hugh's background prior to that was audio, and uh, I had never met Hugh or seen him, and I'd been there maybe four days, and I'm setting up, uh, setting up some uh, videotape machines, which was quite a chore back then, and uh, this man walks up to me and says, who are you? And uh, I told him who I was, but I, he didn't tell me who he was. And then he just started asking questions about how videotape machines work, and very deep into technology. And I'm wondering, is this a tourist? Is this a friend of David Hall, the general manager's, or somebody putting me on? Because, again, I'm new. And then he kind of walked away. He, after he, we had that discussion, then I find out that was Hugh Hickerson. <laughs> who was embellishing all of his knowledge that he acquired at Ampex and was regurgitating a week's worth of classes so and wanted to find out if the new hire actually knew the same thing he knew. And so I used to uh, work with Revis Hobbs over there and, uh, and learned about transmitters and, and uh, water-cooled tubes <laughs> and, and caterpillar generators and towers and I used to climb that tower um, three or four times a month to to work on the uh, ENG receiver that we had up there. Uh, this You're talking about the tower on Knob Hill. Yes. The, the big tower. Yeah. That was but that tower is probably close to a thousand feet, isn't it? 1,368 yeah. and a half feet. Not to be too precise about it. <laughs> Revis uh, was involved with uh, the guy that uh, had the record uh, distributing company. I can't think of what his name was. Um, but he owned a radio station. And uh, we bought the station. And uh, they decided to... Um, put it in a control room for the television Studio B uh, because Studio B on Knob Hill had never been activated and uh, so the control room for Studio B was there basically a blank room and so they decided to put the control room for the radio station into Studio B and put the antenna uh, on the WSM TV tower and uh, so I really wasn't involved with the installation of the, um, of the RF part of the system. But the music and talking about the, the music, I, I never had any particular interest in the music uh, at all, you know. I was interested purely in the science and the, the dynamics, I guess you'd say. Of the uh, of the audio itself. Well, I remember you being pretty much a stickler for audio. On this. Well, because I knew that the uh, the whole foundation of the uh, network was music, and that uh, that audio was had to be uh, a prominent, very prominent part of the uh, the uh, technical facility, uh, and you know people. Other management, okay, tended to be more interested in the video, and and I felt like that the audio was kind of getting lost, and uh, and that it was not being given the consideration and the prominence that it needed in a uh, uh, an entertainment medium, uh, you know, that was built on on audio. He, he was over the maintenance department for audio and did a lot of the Opera House and worked with uh, WSM Radio. And um, then when Opera Land Productions came along, uh, they started hiring more and more technical people and they got larger. Uh, Wayne Callagher was the chief engineer at the time and he uh, promoted um, Hugh to be assistant chief. So you were there with Hugh during the conversion from Opera Land Productions to TNN? Correct. And Hugh pretty much had the control over that whole project. I mean, it, it was uh, obviously an executive decision to have it, but most of the duties of getting the mechanics ironed out of uh, how to put a cable uh, channel on the air uh, was a lot spearheaded by Hugh. I mean, yeah, and of course we got into the satellite business. It was, it was a big deal, and Hugh, and by that time, uh, Wayne Callagher had moved on to director of engineering over WSM Inc. and had moved to uh, uh, Channel 4's headquarters, and Hugh was the guy. Uh, I got into management, I guess, 
I, I don't really know why they decided to promote me into management, but but I got into management and was responsible for the whole shebang, I guess you'd say. We kind of skipped over the uh, development of WSM-FM, which uh, that was my first uh, uh, real audio project at uh, WSM-TV. When, uh, when they bought WLWM and uh, decided to turn it into a uh, 100 thousand watt uh, FM stereo station, well, they, they made me responsible for installing all this equipment in uh, equipment. TV Studio B. He was hands on everything. I, I, he was like a sponge. I've never seen somebody uh, absorb so many factors because not only was it the technical part and the systems designs uh, of getting that coordinated, not that you know he created every single thing, but if he didn't do it, he got, he got the right people on board to do that and we, we assembled a very good team and I think before it's over we had about a hundred people on the engineering staff to man all this stuff but he was also managing personnel there was a whole another thing going on uh, which was interesting at the time for me and I spent a lot of time with Hugh because the company didn't really want a union to be there but we needed to be fair to the employees and payment uh, compensation packages um, and he worked hard on that but as far as the system as far as Opry House and all that stuff uh, I think he had a lot to do with being able to distribute as much audio in that plant as he did in a way that was pretty unconventional. We ended up using telephone blocks uh, and doing uh, tie lines between them that people would look at that layout and think there is no way that's going to work without hum and everything else. But again, Hugh was a smart guy. I think uh, between his knowledge and others, the grounding system that we used actually proved that to be wrong. We had great success and we we did a lot of great engineering things and basically because Hugh was fearless to take some of that stuff on and be a little creative instead of going to some of the traditional and more constrictive things. We built a lot of equipment too because people just didn't make the right thing so we actually designed and built stuff and that was all um, promoted by Hugh. He was all behind uh, if they don't make it we'll make it and we did. You were one of the first people instrumental in implementing user bits in timecode. Right, and that idea came from a company in California. They would uh, take an audio track when, uh, when they were making uh, music videos, they would take an audio track and they would play it and record it on the video while they were making different video cuts. You know, and in effect, this gave them multi-track video, okay? Um, but they they never actually put the user bits into the editing machine, the thing that that would sync up the machines the and uh, yeah, and and I uh, modified uh, the uh, editing system that we had so that that it would actually look at the user bits instead of the time code. You know, because the the uh, time code standard had had a um, a set of time time code, and then it had a set of user bit time codes, and the user bit time codes was supposed to be set with thumb wheels, and that just described the cut. Okay, told you what cut it was, but, but it wasn't but, dynamic. Yeah, right, but you could put it in if you synced it. You know, and and put in a and I can't remember exactly how I did this, but some way or other you could sync it and, and make the, the uh, time code uh, advance just like the time did. And by putting this, this, the time code off the audio machine, the mix down, okay, by putting the time code off that machine into the user bits on the video when it was recorded, and then when you went to do the edit, you just switched your editor over to look at the user bits, that synced everything up. Now sometimes it will be off one frame or a half frame and you can make an adjustment to, to take well, that Anybody was using user bits like that until you came up with that. Yeah, yeah. And those first ones that were built were all, uh, they were hand-wired. Oh uh, yeah. I, were, I, they wire wrapped, I, wire wrapped I, stuff. 
I would put a, a 8 bit switch, a, my integrated circuit, and I'd turn it upside down and hot glue it to the, <laughs> and put a wire wrap socket on it and wire. <laughs> Did you have any family life back then? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've said many times that uh, my kids were raised by my wife, and uh, uh, there's a whole lot of, uh, of my kids' um, youth that I missed, you know, when they were going to Little League and all those kinds of things. I was, uh, I was working or, or I was somewhere, you know. When, when you watch television now, do you, do you ever think about what the technology, think about the technology that might be going on? Well, I think about some of it, but, um, you know, there's so much stuff I was thinking, uh, as a matter of fact, this morning when I was uh, walking in the water at the, the gym, I, I uh, was thinking about uh, time code and uh, color subcarriers and uh, uh. <laughs> he was a uh, mentor for me and I appreciate a lot of what I learned from working with you. Uh, again, there were a lot of great people out there, but um, I think they picked a great person for the leadership role that he took. And I think that the success of TNN uh, was uh, due to the organizational ability of him and getting on the air and actually making it work and keeping it working. I mean, that's the other thing. It, it just continues to go on. And uh, I wish him well, and I think he's well-deserved for this Lifetime Achievement Award. Ladies and gentlemen, in recognition of his technical excellence, Mr. Hugh Hickerson. Well, I'm not much of a speaker, and uh, I, I, I guess about the only thing I can say is thank you. It's been great to bring up all these memories, and, and uh, I guess one of my weaknesses in my older age is that I don't remember near as many things as Tom was talking about, but uh, <laughs> I, I guess I was there. Thank you. <laughs> thank you again. <laughs>